First of all, there's the most stupid way to address a currency crisis uh, is using uh, security means. It's, it, it doesn't work. What happens is that if you close these platforms, these platforms, they actually provide a service that you, it gives you an indicator of how much the prices are in the market. And once you, once you uh, uh, limit access to uh, these uh, these platforms, then uh, it bec the market becomes even more chaotic. Each one prices in the way they see fit rather than having some kind of indicator or some kind of benchmark that you could use against. So it, it only made things more chaotic. Another thing is with this uh, crackdown on uh, the exchange houses, the unlicensed exchange houses, what it eventually does is that uh, uh, it, they end up going underground. Uh, and when they go underground, uh, it becomes more dodgy, more shady, more risky. And uh, once these, once the job of being an exchange house becomes riskier, they will they will charge a larger premium on exchange house on on making ex exchanges essentially as a compensation for the fact that this job has become more risky, and that will reflect in a less favorable exchange rate. So what we've noticed is that once the crackdown happened, the exchange rate skyrocketed. So the concern is that BDL still tries to arbitrarily influence the exchange rate in an artificial way, which will still uh, which which will still open the door for the black market. Because at the end of the day, the black market exists to fill a gap that uh, licensed exchange offices, banks, and BDL cannot fill. Uh, so uh, so uh, so it really depends on whether or not they implement this correctly whether or not they uh, leave the platform price according to supply and demand, uh, rather than BDL interfering directly into the pricing and arbitrarily setting a certain price. It's important here to link this to BDL's decision to price at the market rate. I think what they're trying to do here when they by introducing the platform, essentially, uh, is uh, to find a way to uh, absorb these dollars from aid in a way that does not get them into trouble with the donors. How is that going to be? By saying, okay, we have this electronic platform, which prices at the market rate. Uh, banks will now play the role of the exchange house, because at the end of the day, a family that is receiving such an amount of money, they will eventually exchange it for lira to consume. So what we're saying is that, okay, the platform will facilitate for banks to play that role and uh, and they will absorb these dollars. Yeah. And this is not only for the World Bank aid, there's also aid uh, through the World Food Program, there's also aid for refugees. I think this is going to be harmonized across all, uh, where all humanitarian aid will be received in dollars, but then will be dispersed in lira at the market rate uh, by saying, okay, the, sort of, the, the banks will play the role of the exchange house. So the main financing for EDL is in dollars, for fuel, basically. Uh, so, uh, so lira per se is not going to be used for the question is, will BDL accept these liras uh, and uh, and uh, basically use them to import fuel. So basically, will they will they use their own dollars, whatever is left of the dollars, to import fuel so that we could finance uh, the electricity? Electricity that that kind of amount is actually it's not a small amount, but it's not a huge amount relative to how much lira is already there in the market. Uh, but this is just part of uh, essentially buying time in the absence of a plan. So there's no plan. Let's just buy time, buy time until uh, some miracle happens, whatever that miracle is. The, re the consequences of the delay is that we're accumulating more and more losses. Uh, the, 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 the more we delay, uh, the more we'll see a collapse in the exchange rate. We're seeing it uh, happen right now. And now if they are going to resume negotiations with the IMF, the current plan will have to uh, be adjusted 
uh, the assumptions will have to change. The assumptions on the exchange rate, on the economic situation, they will have to change, and they will change for the worst. So initially in the plan, they were making an assumption that in the first year, the exchange rate will be 3,500. Clearly, that is no longer applicable right now, right now as a result of the policy in action that has been going on for over a year. So first thing would be that restructuring. Second would be restructuring the banking sector. Uh, the banking sector is the main creditor of the government. They are the main they are the main holder of government debt. So obviously if they are holding most of the debt and you write off a large part of that debt, they will have to incur losses. And the losses are so large that uh, some of it will also have to be incurred by uh, uh, depositors. Hopefully in that case would be the big depositors. So we would have to have a fair allocation of losses. There's no way to avoid it. Uh, so here we're talking about bank restructuring and uh, a bail-in of deposits, basically what is termed colloquially as a haircut on deposits. Uh, we need to uh, implement a uh, uh, restructuring of the government's fiscal stance, government's budget. Essentially, we need to... Government has been running double-digit budget deficits uh, for too long. It will have to reduce that deficit. Uh, We're also talking about sectoral reforms. We're talking about uh, restructuring uh, electricity de Liban, which is a major uh, which is a major expense and which is a major contributor to uh, government expenses. We're also talking about unifying the exchange rates. We cannot coexist with multiple exchange rates. We'll have to unify the exchange Exchange rate, and that would entail some kind of floating of the exchange rate. You'll have, we could have one exchange rate that would form the basis of all contracts or exchanges or whatnot. So these are uh, the main points that we need to look at.